Houston, we have a problem. I have a really bad feeling about this. A no boy's best friend is his mother. Hasta la vista, baby. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Rose? Well, we're going, we don't need Rose. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Silent Green is people! Yo, I did it! I did it! Let's put a smile on that face. I gotta warn you, Clark. They don't play the same games here as they do at them regular casinos. Oh, yeah, old too. Welcome back to Casino Royale with Cheese. My name is Shane. Uh, this is the show where we discuss movies that were number one at the box office exactly 20 years ago. This is episode 16. With me today, I am joined by my boy, the man who couldn't tell you the difference between an asteroid and a comet. This is Mike. Well, normally I'm a little offended by your comments at the beginning of the show, and I thought <laughs> I'd get used to them by now. But to be honest, I do not know the difference between a fucking asteroid and a comet. I think one's made out of ice and the other one's made out of rock. You're asking the wrong guy here, dude. <laughs> oh, you don't fucking know either? No, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, this ain't a science show, everybody. So, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, the only thing I could think of is that uh, comets are like in a rotation, if you will. Like Haley's Comet comes by every like 100 years. Um but I don't think that's the case with asteroids. But I'm uh, just gonna say, if you're gonna like say something about like that, you should probably know your facts. We weren't talking about me. I was talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> no, um, yeah, this is Casino Royale with Cheese. Uh, I'm Shane. That's Mike, and we are here to discuss a movie that was number one 20 years ago at the box office. Um. This is actually kind of more in my wheelhouse, Mike, because uh, this is a movie I had seen before. Uh, I mean, I'd seen like City of Angels, wasn't, you know, whatever. Uh, and then <clears throat> following up, I never saw like He Got Game uh, or none of that stuff. And so this is more like whenever I started, you know, getting into the 1998 uh, stuff at this point, you know. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are we talking about today? We are talking about the porn hit Deep Impact. Deep Impact. <laughs> yeah. There was some deep impacting going on. They ain't talking about Mullers here. <laughs> Dude, every time, like, one of the, um, you know, like, Facebook feeds or any of those social media things, or even back in the day when they would do, like, email chains, and uh, they would say, like, uh, give the best title of a movie that would make a, also make a great porn title. Right. Um, I always said Deep Impact. Deep Impact. That's it. <laughs> Fair enough. That's good stuff. Um, first off, I want to go ahead and try to discuss this moderately large elephant in this mid-sized room. Um, as everybody that watches this on YouTube well knows, um, I typically will go through and try to edit in like the movie trailer. To give you something to watch, I know I don't want to hear me talk without any sort of visual stimulation for an hour. <laughs> or plus an hour. Or two, yeah. Right. And so that's kind of the thing, is that typically I would go through and put a trailer back or something like that to, for you to watch if you happen to glance over. And uh, anybody that listens to this on a podcast, uh, this discussion here is going to be the only difference that you're going to see. But... Um, <coughs> My goodness, Mike is having problems. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> You're good, man. Um, no, uh, the the whole thing about it is that there's been issues. Anybody that spent more than 20 seconds on YouTube knows that, like, uh, the copyright hits and stuff like that are a pretty major issue for a lot of, of uh, content creators on YouTube. And technically, a lot of that stuff falls into fair use, which... I don't know how familiar you are with it, Mike, outside of what I've told you about it. But yeah, I mean, a little bit. If it's yeah. like publicly released, it's fair use. Right. That is uh, as long yeah, as you're that's... not using it for profit. Right. That's that's uh, you know, public domain or whatever um, stuff like that. Like really old movies, like the Wizard of Oz books, are public domain and stuff like that. But 
uh, more so to what we're talking about is there's they have copyright laws obviously so i can't take for example and get a copy of the avengers infinity war and put it on youtube that's i mean in fair you know as well it should be you know um i didn't create that content and it shouldn't be broadcast over the internet however um there is kind of a niche in there where if you're discussing a movie or something like that and you're either providing like an educational video or like say you know we we're talking about deep impact and i was showing clips of it because i was like this isn't the way that comets travel through space or whatever then you know that should fall under fair use you know because you're actually creating your own content by like providing a critique or an educational video or even parody falls into that um however you fall into that weird uh paradigm where nowadays they don't want you to like youtube's really started to crack down on uh this this whole deal with uh you know copyrighted works and things of that nature and so it's i was trying to forego it and put up a lot of copyright uh hit disputes and stuff like that but it actually last week wound up delaying the video and so I've decided basically at this point instead, it's just going to essentially be like a title card that you're going to see whenever me and Mike are actually doing the discussion on so the what YouTube happened? video. Well, so whenever I put up, usually when I put up a video, um, there would be an issue where it would say, like, this video is being restricted from viewing in a certain country or, you know... Um, like the owner of this material has put like a they've monetized this video for their own purposes and stuff like that um and then last week whenever i posted he got game it was said this video is straight up blocked altogether nobody's gonna see it um until we work out this dispute and that's when i was like mm, no man that's not gonna work you know and so well, I we get up disputed like every week yeah it's it's been an ongoing thing um but the dispute really because it's the movie studios that are kind of policing themselves and so it's really at their own behest as to whether or not they wanted to unblock that from uh, happening and so i said screw it finally and was like i'm just gonna put up i made a little title card real quick and i've refined it a dozen times since then <laughs> mm. but uh yeah it has you know the name of the show mike and my's names um and then all of our social media stuff on there um, and so there's that, but I'm afraid that that's probably about the best it's going to get, um, until me and Mike are at a point where we can do something else format wise, which we talked about, but it's not feasible at this point. So nope, not yet. Nope. But, uh, so that's, what's going on. Once again, if you're listening to this in podcast form, then you're not, it's not going to make any difference to you at all. So, but, uh, so Good that is, they is, say is that. I think the majority of our listeners listen to podcasts. I'd almost have to, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, on to what, uh, so very few of you are tuning in to listen to, <laughs> um, we're talking about deep impact and, uh, what, uh, what experience do you have with deep impact, Mike? So again, um, my memory deserves me. I don't think I've ever seen this movie before I watched it. Oh really? I Elijah Woods in it. Yeah. Lily <laughs> Sobieski's in it. Yeah, she's kind of ki- a. They're kids. Yeah, they are. I don't. It's think really weird. I've seen to it. Think about. Yeah, this was like uh, three years before Elijah Wood went on to do Lord of the Rings, which is crazy to me. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, th- there's and there's a ton of like actors. A ton it, of actors that are like well known, like their names are known, and yeah. I'm pretty positive I had never seen this movie. I thought I had. I yeah. remember my memory was that it was like a cheap copy of Armageddon, mm-hmm. but Armageddon doesn't come out for a few more months. No, it doesn't. Um, this was actually in production whenever they found out that there had been a script called Armageddon floating around, um, and at one point actually. Whenever President Beck in the movie is giving his little speech for the first time on TV, kind of announcing to the public what's going on and so forth, 
Um, at one point he's talking about like, this isn't the end of society, this isn't the end of the human race or life as we know it. He said, uh, this is not Armageddon and they actually had to edit it out of the movie because I guess they didn't want to give uh, Armageddon any sort of like free press or anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I recall, I saw this before I saw Armageddon and uh, I mean, you know my take on that. <laughs> But, um, yeah, all in all, um, whenever I was, I must have been 14 years old, and my older sister, she was dating this uh, fellow of the Mormon faith, and super good guy, like, their whole family was awesome, just like the South Park episode, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but uh, all around, though, they would always go to movies, they watched, like, Gattaca, in this and uh he was really into blues brothers for some reason but <laughs> but uh so they went and saw this and i thought it looked good but once again i was 14 didn't have a license or anything so i had to rent it and i watched it i thought it was pretty good all around but right on we'll see if my opinion has changed <clears throat> um that being said like my kid mentioned there's a slew of actors that are in this um We've got Robert Duvall, who's at the time, I don't think he was as, as big as he had been in previous decades, but he's still a pretty well-known actor. Uh, Taya Leone, she had been in a lot of stuff, and she'd go on to be in Jurassic Park 3. And she had just uh, about, I want to say it was three, four years before this, she was on Bad Boys. Oh, okay. I remember that. And I, Like, from, I think Bad Boys came out in, like, 95, and from, like, 95 yeah. to 98, like, Tia Leone, she was like a big deal. Mm-hmm. She had her own TV show, uh, I want to say The Naked Truth, back in the day. And uh, she was the star on that thing. It was a little sitcom where she was like a, some kind of news reporter, I think. She was such a big deal, man. She was mentioned in like rap songs. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> but uh, my knowledge of rap is limited. To say but, the least. Uh, to say the least, yeah. I'm, I'm not typically down. <laughs> no, um, she was married to David Duchovny at the time. Mm. We had a movie coming out later this year that we'll discuss. Um, so they were kind of the, the Hollywood sweethearts to a degree. Not as famous as like your Brangelina or whatever they're calling that thing now. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Elijah Wood, who had been in a couple things... Um, he was in The Good Son before this. Yeah, he was in The Good Son. He was The Good Son. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, wanted to say he was in Jumanji, but that wasn't him. That was Kirsten Dunst and that other kid that was in that. But he was in some stuff before this, but he would explode a few years later into really popular territory. Um, we've got Morgan Freeman, who plays the president. And in about a million movies. Yeah, I'm just going to say right now, if you want, I don't care what political affiliation you have, uh, put Morgan Freeman on the ticket, and I'm voting for that dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Just for his speeches <laughs> alone. Yeah, yeah. I would watch every State of the Union address. <laughs> From, yeah, it'd be on my DVR, bro. <laughs> right? I'd put it on, just like something to fall asleep to, whatever. Yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> um. Who else we got in this thing? We've got uh, John Favreau, the uh, guy that was the director of Iron Man and Elf and like the Jungle Book, the new one. Well, he did. Um, um, he was the uh, what was his big show? Was it Swingers? Yeah, with him and Vince Vaughn. Yeah. Yeah, I guess him and Vince Vaughn are like boys. Yeah, they're definitely um, buddies. Yeah, because they were. He even had like a bit in like Four Christmases and stuff like that. I think they're from that Windy City or Second City uh, improv like that. that. SCTV thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. That could very well be, because that was, I guess Rick Moranis was like the old uh, alumni from that and like John Candy and stuff. I guess these guys were like second generation maybe. Right. But, yeah. Uh, we had James Cromwell, who had won an Oscar for Babe. Fantastic actor. Um. Let's see, we got... Red. Uh, yeah, Kurtwood Smith. He plays the mission control guy. I actually wrote his name down. But uh, 
I we'll guess get we'll there. To get to it, yeah. But uh, yeah, Red Foreman. That's the second movie we talked about with him in it. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, um, oh, what's that? Damn, I can't remember his name. All of a sudden, he's got a really cool name. He's the Dugray Scott. You no, know, the the uh, the black gentleman in the movie. Um, oh, uh, Blair Underwood. Blair Underwood. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, he's in it. Uh, we've got Richard Schiff, who plays um, Elijah Wood's dad. But I, I know I've seen that dude in some stuff, but I didn't look it up. Uh, yeah, I think he's then, been bit parts and everything. Yeah. He's that guy that you see all the time, but you don't know his name. Probably plays a dad a lot. Right. Uh, Lily Sobieski, as you mentioned before. Mm-hmm. So this... Oh, Maximilian Schell. Um, the only thing I knew him from was The Black Hole. With uh, It was this old, like... Disney ripoff movie from they were trying to basically rip off Star Wars, which is ironic since they own Star Wars now. Yeah, they were trying for a long time, right? And so, uh, yeah, that was he was in that. He played like this mad scientist dude. If but, you can't uh, beat him, buy him. <laughs> right? It cost him, but you know they did it. Well, so they own Marvel too. I mean, Disney owns yeah. everything. Absolutely. Yeah, this is. Hey, we're gonna do a little caveat real quick. I didn't know about this until not long ago, Mike. Do you know that Disney was actually like rapping on death's door uh, as recent as like 2005? They're actually going to sell to Comcast. Uh, I know that the Disney movie Renaissance, which is when they refer to like Lion King, Aladdin, um, yeah, started Little with Mermaid, like the Little Mermaid, yeah. When all those movies came out, it, like those movies basically saved Disney. Uh, and yeah. then it, it started to plummet again, and then Toy Story saved Disney. Mm-hmm. And they started to plummet again. And then I guess they got rid of Michael Eisner, and they got the dude in there that they have now as the CEO. And his whole, like, business model is that we need to acquire stuff, you know? And uh, doing a great job of that. <laughs> he bought everything, pretty much, yeah. you know? But, yeah. Do so. you know Fox is owned by Disney now? There you go. That's it, man. Fox, like the edgy network, is owned by right. Disney now, who also owns ABC, who also owns ESPN. Right. And you were saying, too, that they had like a partial stake in Hulu? Uh, so I heard they bought Hulu that? straight up, and oh, their eventual go. goal is to launch all their content on Hulu exclusively. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be awesome. It'll be interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so there's there's a bunch of stuff going around with that. I was going to mention something else, but I don't remember what. And me and Mike are already bullshitting. The quiz. So. <laughs> Give yeah, my quiz. let's let's get to that. Um, first off, let's let's discuss here. Uh, this movie was made on a budget. I gotta say, a pretty impressive budget of uh, seventy five million dollars. Mm. Considering all the visual effects and all the star power that was in this thing, that's pretty impressive, really. Um, how many weeks would you guess this was number one, Mike? Did it make two weeks? Are you asking or are you telling? I think that's my <laughs> guess, two weeks. Yeah, you're right. It was two weeks, exactly. All right. Yeah, so one in the book. Um, along with that, um, what would you guess its domestic take was overall? Well, last week gave me a lesson in this. Uh, I don't think it made its money back. I'm going to say it made $40 million. <laughs> You're way off, bro. <laughs> what? Yeah, it made uh, $140,464,000 and some change dollars back in the U.S. Oh, so. like over the whole length of the film or like the opening weekend or what? No, total. Uh, oh, total in okay. the U.S. take, yeah. Yeah, Which, that one. Yeah, by about a hundred million dollars. But yeah. Oh, it's a hundred million dollars. Meh, whatever. Make up the difference. Um overall it's worldwide take. I this actually kinda surprised me. It was uh just shy of three hundred fifty million. So this thing did pretty good, you know, all things considered. For a movie you never saw. <laughs> well apparently. it is a movie that covers something that would impact the entire globe. Right. It would. That's something I need to talk. We need to discuss as well, but we'll get to it. Um. Well, let's kick this shirt shit bird off and let's get started. Okay. Uh, this came out, by the way, May eighth, nineteen ninety eight. So just so y'all are tracking. But um, yeah, 
Well, well, I guess we can talk about it now. First off, so this movie takes place on like a global scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously. So that being the case, everything that you see going on in this movie, minus maybe a little blurb on the TV every so often, is all like United States centric stuff, you know? <laughs> yep. Like, yeah, there's they Except act as for though, one dude. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't even play that big a part in the movie. But <laughs> he's a nuclear physicist. Well, yeah, fair enough. But uh, that's what kind of cracks me up about this. At least with Armageddon, you did get the feeling that I mean, you could see like parts of China and stuff like that in peril and things of that nature, which we'll discuss later this year. But with this, they don't spend any anything that happens in this movie is in the U.S. completely, you know. But uh, anyway, the the film opens. And uh, we're in Richmond, credit. Virginia. Yeah. Before that, in the credits, we find out this is produced by Spielberg. So there mm. you go. But uh, yeah, it's in Richmond. Um, there seems to be some kind of, I guess, a school astronomy club. I call it Star Class. But yeah, star we find class. out. We find out later it's an astronomy club. <laughs> yeah, that's where all the cool kids hang out. Is in the Star Class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's uh being the astronomy nerd, that's a panty dropper there, man. <laughs> but it worked for uh, Theo. For Leo, yeah. Um, Leo is Elijah Wood's character, by the way. And he's flirting with Sarah, his little uh, not-girlfriend, Lily Sobieski. Yeah. Um, and then we get this teacher that's kind of a douche bag, I want to no, say. No, he's not. He's a teacher. This is an extracurricular activity. Like, give the boy a chance to do his thing you no know. he's not there to chaperone <laughs> dates he's there to teach kids man okay fair enough um do you think that the school provides the telescopes or do you gotta buy your own for this i don't know they look pretty high dollar that's what i'm saying because <laughs> i know that if i was running a school i'd be like we'll get one and y'all can take turns <laughs> right but, yeah um anyway uh we've got they basically he's like oh okay you guys are paying attention so what's that star right there and they start rattling off these stars or whatever and he's uh leo's like i don't know what that one is though and uh, he's like i don't know let me take a look and the teacher checks it out he's like I, it's probably just a shooting star or something i'm not sure and uh so i guess they mail in a picture of it to this observatory that's uh in tucson arizona yeah, Adrian Peak Observatory. Yeah. And it's got one of those guy. legit, mm -hmm. like, giant telescopes. Yeah. That, like, takes one. up a whole building thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know what those are called, but it's awesome. So, um, anyway, there's uh, this guy, uh, oh, what was his name? Wolf. Wolf, that's it, yeah. That, I don't think they say his first name, but. Uh, He's like Dr. Wolf or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's doing a little bit of research on this unidentified star, and he while he's eating pizza, real grossly, by the way, he's like, nom, <laughs> nom, 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 nom. dude, that pizza looked like ass in general. It was all lie, floppy man. and gross. <laughs> yeah, that thing looked like it'd been there hours. And it's funny because my wife, she later went to take a nap about two minutes after this, but she was like, that pizza looks horrible. <laughs> yeah, it didn't look good at all. No. And uh, so he's like, oh, shit. And so it turns out he finds something out. Um, well, he... Okay, so what happens is he plots the location the kids send him the picture of. And right. he does some mathematic equation on his computer. And it's bound for Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, he immediately panics. Uh, names the star Wolf... Uh, Biederman. Bidinger? Biederman, yeah. He yeah. names the star Wolf Biederman... Because he doesn't know that this is like a high school kid. Right. Um, so he names it Wolf Biederman and uh, puts it on a three and a half inch floppy disk because the server is down. I was so glad to see that three and a half inch floppy, man. <laughs> it Were did you? my heart good. Yeah. Okay. That's my, my old schoolness there. Uh, anyway. And then he jumps in his Jeep and hauls ass with a floppy disk. Yeah. He's yep. trying to call somebody on his phone while he's yeah, driving. Yeah, no cell phone service. So and then he finally gets through. This movie's pretty much nailed in 1998. Thing. The server's down and no mm -hmm. cell phone service. Right. Everything was in its infancy. Mm -hmm. Finally, when he does get a signal, um, it's this stupid automated system that he's having a futz around with. 
And uh, then we get this semi driver that's going down the same road the opposite direction. And you see this dude drinking a tall boy, <laughs> like Colt 45. <laughs> yeah, he's drinking beers and smoking cigarettes. Right? That's what uh, I would call an irresponsible, uh, irresponsible truck driver. I would have to agree with that. I would agree. Um, dude ends up dropping a cigarette. Uh, and so this Jeep that Dr. Wolf is in, like, plows right into his gas tank. And uh, bounces off, goes sailing over the edge of this uh, cliff. And fucking and... explodes. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's just bad luck right there, man. <laughs> yeah, we don't get to know Dr. Wolf very long. Mm-mm. That's why I couldn't remember his name. Yep. We cut um, to one year later in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. We seem to be in some type of, like, news um, Like a like news conference room. type of thing, yeah. Um. And these guys are just sitting around BSing. They're talking about uh, this, uh, oh, what's the Secretary of uh, uh, Treasury's name? Yeah. Alan. Oh, man, I had it a minute ago. It's. uh, It doesn't matter. Alan Rittenhouse. Alan Rittenhouse. That's it. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, yeah, they're talking about how this guy all of a sudden resigned. Um from his role in the presidential cabinet. And uh, basically, uh, we meet Jenny Lerner, played by Taya Leone. And she has a little friend there named Beth that's also a reporter, I guess. And she's going to try to find out as much as she can about this thing because they have apparently gotten information that, um, that he resigned because of this affair that he was having with somebody named Ellie. She got one of his staffers drunk. Over breakfast. That's what it was, yeah. The staffer's been trying to bang her for a while, so she manipulated him over breakfast, and he spilled mm-hmm. some beans. That's what it was. We yeah. cut to to Jenny drinking with her mom for like brunch. Yeah. Like find out, yeah. yeah, find out the Jenny's got a new stepmom who's two years older than her. <laughs> Did you recognize who the mom was? Yeah, I may mean, definitely recognize her. We've seen her. We talked about her. It was uh, Max from Mission Impossible, the old British lady. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, yes, I get the... So, they don't say it outright. They kind of do. But you definitely get the impression that the dad had had some sort of a relationship with this other woman that he's now married to. And that he basically left the mom high and dry. Um, So, that's what's going on with that. Um but the mom's noticeably upset about it. Um, it's just kind of like passive-aggressive dialogue that she has. But She's pissed. Yeah, she is pissed. Um, we cut back so, to Jenny talking to uh, like, like a, a secretary. secretary, yeah. She's a secretary and, for the Secretary of Treasury. <laughs> secretary squared. Yeah. Secretary she, Seption. She's talked about how she's pretty sure he was having an affair she names the woman that he was having an affair with. Her name mm-hmm. is Ellie. That's it. Uh, yep. She says that he had his own like private phone line. He would shut the door every time she called. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that she's pretty sure the president knows about it because he heard her. He over. She overheard the Secretary of Treasury talk to the president about Ellie. Right. But I guess this uh, Secretary Rittenhouse. He's basically left saying that his wife has some type of illness, and so he wants to be with his family. Right. And that's basically the only thing that they offer, information-wise. Yep. But, and then the, Jenny, being the due diligent reporter, she heads immediately to a boat <laughs> that uh, yep. the, the Secretary of Treasury owns, mm-hmm. meets the daughter Lily, meets yep. the Secretary of Treasury, and he says that uh, my wife is sick and I resigned to be with my family. Right, I just want to take a trip. We're going to go. And she looks, and he's like hoarding canned food and stuff like that. And she's like, this is weird, man. You know? Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, she she's talks to him, and she's piling. like, Right. Yeah. And she's like, well, why don't you tell me about Ellie? And he's like, uh-huh. And so uh, he's like, oh, you think you're a reporter, so you're just going to break the story, huh? And he's like, well, this is the biggest story in the history of the world, you know. But right. I'd appreciate it if you didn't, you know. <laughs> and uh, Sheila's obviously at this point, like, bewildered. Because she's like, politicians have affairs all the time. It's not, I mean, it's a big story, but it's not that big, you know. Yeah, she thinks he's, <laughs> like, pretty big-headed. Yeah. And uh, 
so um, he's being, I wrote suspiciously sinister about the whole thing. Um, but then whenever she is driving back, um, she actually is recording. She's like, maybe it's the president that's having an affair on like her little recorder with the private phone lines and all that stuff. And maybe he just took the fall for the president, you know, whatever. And um, all of a sudden she gets rear-ended. Um, and not in the way that you're thinking. Her car gets rear-ended. <laughs> Deep impact. Um, there you <laughs> That's what the whole movie's about. Is her her uh, wreck that she had. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, So there's three cars that like surround her. Right. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. And uh, basically they pull off onto like an abandoned uh, uh, exit yeah. ramp. Exit ramp, yeah. And they just run over, grab her. They say, FBI, come with us. And they throw her in the car. They haul ass to wherever they go to. And she meets Looks some like guy. Looks like a kitchen somewhere. But yeah, yeah. He, she meets some guy eating his lunch. And shortly after that, we meet Mr. Bennett, a.k.a. the President of the United States of America, played by Morgan Freeman. Mr. Beck. President Beck, actually. Oh, Beck. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Just like the singer. He's a loser, baby. All right. Um. Yeah, he wants her to postpone the story that two she weeks. has picked up on. Yeah, he says two weeks. He's talking to his boy there. He's like, you knew that this story wasn't going to stay under wraps as long as we wanted it to. He said, but, you know, do me a favor. He's like, and don't break this story. He's like, it seems like you've got me over a barrel, but I promise you that's not the case, you know. <laughs> so he agrees he says, with her, or he asks her, and she agrees to wait 48 hours. Right. And he said that if you wait, then I'll give you the first question at the press conference. And she's like, okay. <laughs> well, I'll give you the fir- the center seat, second row, and then she requests for the first question. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, so. We cut to her doing some research back at the newsroom. And pretty quickly, she figures out what the hell Ellie might be. Right. Um, she she finds figures out it's not a name. But yeah. Right. So she, she uh, Google searches the acronym. E-L-E, and right. it directs her to a UC Berkeley website, which mm-hmm. it, it talks about an extinction-level event. Right. And it showed pictures of, like, asteroids and meteors and comets and shit. <laughs> I thought it was funny, um, because whenever she's talking to the president, she says, I'm, uh, he says, uh, you know, we're interested in the best interest of the public. And she's like, wasn't well, the truth in the best interest of the public? And I was like... Oh, man. <laughs> When's the last time a reporter actually gave a crap about the truth, you know? <laughs> There's some reporters out there that do true shit. On occasion, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, she yeah, doesn't see her dad and the new bride. Mm-hmm. The dinner does not go well, and she doesn't want to tell him what she knows. But she's obviously rattled at this point with uh, what's going on. Um. Well, they give her a pair of earrings, mm-hmm. and uh, they said something to the effect of, like, well, you know, life goes on, and, like, <laughs> for her... She laughing. Yeah. Oh, because for her, she, she kind of thinks she knows what's going on, and so she doesn't think life is going on, and right. she <laughs> interrupts her dad to tell him, you need to get back with mom. Right. And even, it is kind of nice, because she actually talks to the new wife, and she's like, Chloe, this isn't... I'm not taking a shot at you here, but... You know, mom's alone. She doesn't have anybody. Dad, we need to go to mom, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird because they, like, go to do this toast and she just, like, takes it to the face and stuff. <laughs> it doesn't even bother her. Yeah, she chugs a martini. <laughs> yeah. And the dad's, like, completely put off. He's like, she's being a total bitch right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. So... Her little friend Beth, they go to this press conference, and uh, her friend's like, "Okay, well, let's go find our seats." And she's like, "Okay." And so she heads up to the front row. Her friend's like, "What the hell?" <laughs> well, the FBI but, yeah. guy she met in the kitchen earlier like grabs her. Mm-hmm. And he, he's like, "Come up here with me. Your seats up here." And he sticks yeah. her right where the president said, "Center row, second or center seat, second row." Right. Uh, no. He. They ask the media to not ask any questions until he's done with his uh, um, State of Union address, basically. Right. And uh, 
he proceeds to let us know that there is a comet the size of New York City headed our way. It is seven miles right. wide and 800 billion tons. Yeah. Quite a big one. Um, one thing that we didn't cover yet, there is a, a plot that you wouldn't think it would have any kind of payoff, but it does. But Beth, uh, her person that she works with, has like a daughter that she like has her at the daycare or whatever at, at the MSNBC. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so the president announces the comment. Um, it's supposed to hit August 16th, uh, a In year from now. about a year, yeah. Yeah. And apparently there is a Russian spaceship uh, that they are... It's not a Russian spaceship. They said it was a ship built in Russia. No. Yeah. Nope. Are you sure? Yep. It's a, sh- it's a <laughs> ship built in space. It's built in orbit <laughs> be- with the teamwork of the Russians and the Americans. I have a, that movie on my computer right now. We can watch it. Oh, I do too. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, the ship they're calling it the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they go through the whole litany of all the astronauts. Uh, we there's meet the Monash. team. Yeah. There's Monash, and he is the like commander of the mission. Um, I wrote their names down, but not everybody's role. There's Baker, Partenza, Tulchinsky. He's the one guy that's not American. <laughs> Partenza is the medical officer. Yeah, there you go. He's um, he's the one that's uh, John Favreau, right? Yep. Yeah. What's th- what's the female's name? Uh, Simon. Is it? She's the pilot of Messiah. Oh, crumb. Uh, the first um, Orin, uh, Orin. Orin Monash. He's is the, the commander. Yeah, he's the team leader. Yeah. You got and the then... Russian dude. He is a nuclear physicist. Okay. You got. Uh, Blair There's Underwood. Baker. Yeah. I can't remember what his exact role is. Yeah. Needless to you, say, yeah. And then you meet, a, um, oh man, the old dude's name. Spurgeon Tanner. Yeah. And he yeah. walked, he was the last man to walk on the moon. He did seven uh, missions to the moon. Mm hmm. So he's our, he's our old salty dog. Right. Yeah. He's just the, the old novice at this thing. Yeah. Um, which is played by, old, um, what's his puss, uh, Robert Duvall. Yeah, I'll tell you something that was pretty cool in like the president's speech. He talked about how there'd be no hoarding, there'll be no price gouging. He is gonna freeze all price raises. So what you paid for a bottle of water yesterday, you'll pay mm-hmm. the same price tomorrow. Like that's some right. pretty insightful shit from the president. It is. What's your opinion on price gouging, Mike? Well, in like the event of something like this, right? It's BS, man. Or a disaster like a flood or something like that. Yeah, it's BS. See, I kind of have a different take on it. It's uh, uh, it's all supply and demand. I get the free markets based on supply and demand, but there's also right. a thing called fucking humanity. Well, there is, and and don't get me wrong, but say you've got like this guy, he's a millionaire, right? Even a billionaire, or whatever, and he's like, dude, I'm gonna buy all of the freaking water in the tri-state area so that my family's like good to go well if water is 98 cents a bottle then he has no problem doing that but if say for instance they do gouge the prices so now it's ten dollars a bottle or whatever now you have an opportunity for everybody to get some more water because this guy's not buying all the crap up you know bullshit if the guy's buying all the water he's purely buying it to make profit he's buying all of the water He's a douchebag. All right. <laughs> I run Coca-Cola. We bottle Dasani water. Right? Right. I can give water away for the next year. It's not going to hurt me. Psh, next year. <laughs> like the next lifetime. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. So like, sometimes we got to have a little humanity. No, I'm, and I'm saying, but in an instance like that, it, I think that it gives everybody an equal opportunity, though, where as opposed to this guy spending, you know, $50,000 buying up as much water as he can well now he doesn't have that that ability to since he can't afford all the water now so other people have an opportunity to buy water is kind of my take on it but hmm. i guess agree to disagree yeah um, uh we found out that the comet or asteroid or meteor whatever the hell it is is called wolf Biederman, named after the two scientists that discovered it 
Mm-hmm. Biederman is watching this on TV. He's like, "Holy shit, that's me!" <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a high school kid. Yeah. Not a scientist, and nor is he dead. Mm-mm. He's very much alive, and that's what the president thinks. Is it was Wolf Biederman was on the name of that envelope, and I guess the wreckage was extensive enough so that they assumed that both people were in the vehicle that exploded at well, the, the beginning of the movie. Did, yeah, the jeep did fucking explode. Yeah. And so I think that they just naturally assumed both of them were in there. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm not dead. <laughs> you know. And so... Um, he becomes an instant celebrity. Mm-hmm. His school does did. like a little Q&A. Right. They do. They have uh, him up there. It's pretty funny. And some kid tells him, like, you're going to have way more sex than the rest of us now. <laughs> yeah. You're a celebrity. The teacher's like, like well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The kids are all excited. And the teacher's like, okay, thanks for your... Uh, expert right. opinion and the kid was like well that's the best part about being a celebrity is all the sex yeah that's why anybody wants to be a celebrity yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> you get to the um the um the astronaut old, party yeah which is such a stereotype in any of these movies the feature an astronaut is the the barbecue before you gotta they go do it up. just because it's expected nowadays you know <laughs> well how else are we gonna meet their kids and their wives I guess so. Get familiarized with them, yeah. Um, and so, pretty much, the guys are just BSing with the kids, whatever. One of them's about to have a kid that's Monash. Um, uh, what's the other dude? I think it's Baker. Um, he's going to get married, isn't it? Yeah, um, he says they're going to get married just as soon as he gets back. Right. And then Tanner, he's just kind of like doing his own thing. And that's where we see Red Foreman, uh, Kurtwood Smith's character. Well, he's talking and, to his sons. Oh, that's what it is. Because they're officers in the Navy. Yeah, they're both Naval officers. They both yeah. went to the Naval Academy just like he did. Right. And uh, I think he's talking to him about uh, coming back and stuff like that. Well, he says, your mom and I, when I was going to the moon. Mm-hmm. Basically, he says, you guys remember when I went to the moon, right? I went seven times. I always came back. Your mom and I played a game. She wouldn't say, promise me you'll come back, and I never said I would. Right. Basically, I'm not saying it this time either. Right, right. That's it, exactly. And so, uh, <laughs> it's uh, after that that uh, Red Foreman, Kerwood Smith, uh, we find out later on that he's the mission control commander. Um, and he goes to talk to him. He's like, so what do you think about the guys? And he's like, well, I mean, they're probably the best guys that you know I've worked with and stuff like that. And then he's like, "What do you really think?" And he's like, "Man, I don't know. It's a new generation, you know. <laughs> like, I'm the old horse here, you know." Well, he's put off by the fact that like they're in better shape than his crew was. Mm-hmm. They're smarter than him and his guys were. Right. Um, they don't drink. They don't do. They don't get into trouble because like back in the day, like NASA was known for like having cowboys. They're party animals, yeah. Yeah, they all drove Corvettes and shit, like, mm-hmm. and he was saying the new generation of, like, NASA are, like, squares. Right. They're, oh. yeah, they were rock stars back then, you know. Yeah, he said the only thing they're worried about is looking bad on TV. Mm-hmm. That's it. So we cut to a scene where at the, they're at the bar, and now we're right. starting to find out what they think about him. Yeah, they're just talking shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, they're like, well, he landed on the moon, but on the moon, there's 16 hours of nighttime, and on here, you only got six hours, you know, and all this other crap, and and just because he landed on the moon doesn't mean that he can land this thing, and so on and so forth. It's retarded. Um, and I guess part of the, the deal is, is that I can kind of see where they're coming from, and that, like, yeah, this guy doesn't have any experience with landing on an asteroid, but on the same token, like, at least he's landed... On something besides the Earth, you know. <laughs> something, and he brings that up. Yeah, they talk about their simulator time, and he's like, "This isn't a video game." Right. Yeah. So they hash yeah. things out pretty quickly and uneventfully. Right. I don't know they, that they ever come to a resolution, but at least they lay everything out, you know. Yeah, they both just express their opinions and move on. Right. Uh, we cut to the shuttle launching. Mm-hmm. Eight uh, nuclear devices on this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't fucking around. Man, that's serious stuff. (laughs) Um, Uh, They talk about how, like, it's got technology on it that they haven't seen before. Basically, they explain to us how how this thing can travel so fast. Right. And one thing I do like about that is because we have 
one of the main characters is a news reporter. And so we actually get to watch her explain this, like, on the news, which is kind of nice. Because <clears throat> it's somebody that we're familiar with at some point. So Yeah, she gets the anchor spot. Yeah, she does. Um, she's actually kind of getting cock blocked by her boss a little bit because she uh, withheld the story, though. So that's kind of a downside. Yeah, he says, you get the anchor, you would have got it five months earlier. And then she's like, I could have? And he goes, that'll teach you never to hold a story back from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Damn, cold-blooded. Yeah, he's he's uh, harboring some feelings. Uh, but um, that doesn't happen yet. The, no. So they get up to the, the Messiah. Right. And then it cuts to five months later, she's on the anchor desk. Right. So if we're to assume that this is a year... This means that with five months, we've got about seven months left until this thing yeah, starts and we, popping off. Yeah, this is where we start to get a lot of time hacks throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Telling us how much There's time a, we have left till impact. Right. Um, they go through, they get, um, uh, after she gets pecker slapped by her editor at the newspaper, we see where she's reporting on them approaching the comet. And, um... The Orion module, there's two separate pieces to this Messiah ship. There's the actual ship itself and then the Orion module, and it approaches the comet. Uh, but there's a yeah, lot of space debris crap. Yeah, the, the Orion module is what Fish is on board to do. Right. He's uh, driving that one in, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, a lot of space debris in the tail of this thing. A um, ton of fucking space debris, dude. They're, yeah. they, they made the comment that these some of these things are the size of a house. Um, a couple of them crash right into the ship, and it just keeps on trucking along. It does. <laughs> I was pretty impressed. I was like, man, because you can't see anything, because there's all this gas coming off of this thing, too, you know? Yeah, they and call it like... the coma of the comet. Mm-hmm. They, make, they say <laughs> coma like four times in a couple minutes. Right. But I was pretty impressed that the ship didn't get completely decimated because, man, that looked like it, it would have been real easy to crash into some shit. But They did. They did crash into some shit. Well, yeah. Yeah, it took out like an antenna array, it looked like, and some other stuff, but it's uh, they made it. They, they made uh, it. They up, landed. Mm-hmm. They wound up, and this is one thing that I actually prefer to this movie over Armageddon was they actually use like these cable tethers and like shoot them down from the ship and just basically reel it into the surface of it because I can imagine landing like a shuttle on a, a moving object like that is damn near next to impossible <laughs> it seems more realistic whenever you're like tethering yourself on there than like they reeling land it in. fighter jets on aircraft carriers that are moving all the time Shane they do that all the time but that's with gravity and they have wheels you know <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah um Anyway, uh, they have they start the clock running at six hours. Um, they have six hours until the sunlight hits, and then at that point, whenever the sunlight hits, basically it's going to go from you know freezing temperatures all the way up to 350 degrees, which is going to cause these gas pockets inside the comet to start expanding. And then basically, they even say it's like working in a minefield at that point, you know? Right. Uh, uh, so we see the crew like disembark the Orion and they got this big like transport thing that they're carrying these devices called the moles on Mm -hmm. drill into it yeah and the moles just crawl down these crevices and they got nuclear warheads on them Mm Mm-hmm. they're trying to get what is it 100 feet below surface I think so yeah Um, Um, why the fuck is the medical officer on this team (laughs) that's a good question man you don't want that dude getting blown out into space, bro. <laughs> no, he needs to be on Orion, waiting right. to gra- to help anybody who gets back on it injured. Yeah, a dude gets screwed up. Take him back to the ship. Doctors yeah. right there. Yeah, doctors. There. No, we're gonna send this dude out there with the bombs. Right, because he's I'm sure really effective when it comes to like doing medical procedures in his astronaut suit. <laughs> But uh, one thing that we didn't address either was that um, they have these, uh, like, uh, sun, these sun visor things. Yeah, these shields that go over their, their helmet to basically block out the sun. Because here on Earth, if we look at the sun, it's through an atmosphere, but there is not one on this comet. Uh, meanwhile, one of the moles has only gone down 75 feet instead of the 
hundred feet that it's supposed to go to. Um, two of the guys go in to into the hole that it's drilling to try to like jar it loose. Um, no, Orion goes down there and starts jumping on it. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Which jumping on it with no gravity, I don't know how effective it would be. But what else are you gonna yeah, do? He, it worked. He got it, it loose and it started moving back down. Mm-hmm. And then it comes. D go ahead. D uh, just as he gets it going, he gets back up to the surface, and the comet has rotated to the point where now the sun is on the surface that they are at. Right. So they're hauling ass, trying to get back to the Orion, and uh, it's just shit's blowing up all around him. It's pretty pretty crazy looking. Um, yeah, shit is literally exploding like everywhere. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this is one thing that me and Mike just talked about was their medical officer gets blown out into space by one of these gas pockets, and uh, yeah, yeah, he's a thousand feet away in seconds. <laughs> right, and so uh, we also get to the point because Monash, the mission commander, he uh, was out. Uh, he was in the hole whenever they hit the sunlight, and so he didn't think to put his, like, sun visor down. And so, like, the next thing you know is he's, like, whenever... They all wind up getting blown out, essentially, but they're all, like, tethered down. And so he, like, gets this full blast of, like, the sunlight right in his face. And um, so after that, he's blind. And he gets injured, too. Yeah, one of the things I didn't understand, too, is, like, so they were all tethered together... Right. Because Morash got ejected from the tunnel. He got blasted out of there. Right. But they were tethered together, so he's safe. Right. And then we hit a gas pocket that explodes, and Pethesda? Perezda? Par Partenza? Yeah. Partenza. Yeah. Partenza gets launched to fucking outer space. Right. Why wasn't he hooked up to everybody else? <laughs> oh, he's just the doctor. We're not going to tether him down. <laughs> he's fine. Yeah, physician, heal thyself. <laughs> yeah, so Gus is gone. Three guys make it back to the ship. And after a little debate between um, Fish and the Russian guy, they're leaving Gus behind. Yeah. The Russian dude wants to go after him. Um, Fish, by the way, is Spurgeon. And uh, they just yeah. call him Fish, and we find out later why. But... Uh, yeah, he's like, there's no point. You know, we're going to waste more fuel trying to get him, and it's not going to happen anyway. So, <clears throat> If we go after him, we all die. Right. Um, and so they, at one point they actually talk about how they're hoping that the nuke knocks this thing off course, but I got the impression that they're actually more so hoping to destroy it. Um, but maybe it's a combination of the two. Like they blow it in half or something like that, and then the two halves will go their separate direction or whatever. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they uh, said that um, they they go ahead and they blow the nukes that they set up. Yeah, they detonate, thing, detonate it sitting right next to it. They do. It's a bad move <laughs> all around. <laughs> yeah, it rocks the fuck out of the ship. Like, yeah. what did they expect was going to happen? It's a nuke. <laughs> I'm just saying. Four of them. There's four nukes. Right. Yeah. It's pretty bad. And that's, this isn't like Hiroshima nukes either. Like, nukes are way cooler in 1998 than they were 50 years before or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, the the uh, Messiah gets rocked pretty badly. Um, and then we get a press, uh, like an Oval Office type deal from President Beck. He says yep. that they've broken it apart. There's a smaller piece. But, and I think he said it was a mile and a half, but there's still that other one that's like six miles. He's like, and it's, we're really still screwed, you know, at this point. Yeah, um, we now have two fucking pieces coming mm -hmm. towards us. Yeah. One's not as bad as the other one, but after, with a combination of the two, we're pretty much done. Um, he does. This is where I think the president has some real balls, by the way. I agree. Um, he goes on to announce that their next they have some plans one is that US and Russia are going to launch all the Titan missiles at this thing mm -hmm. and they're pretty confident they'll succeed yeah. but just in case they don't they've been building <laughs> an underground cave system limestone in Missouri in the limestone Missouri. Yeah. yeah that they're calling the Ark the Ark and that it's got enough room for a million people to survive for two years right and that they are going to bring seedlings and plants and animals, just like Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, 200,000 of the residences resident residents have already been predecided based on selected like, yeah yeah based on like scientific medical military needs all that stuff right and that the eight the next 800,000 will be selected randomly through like a lottery system right uh, nobody uh, over the age of 50 yeah you're out if you're up to 50 bro right <laughs> that sucks um, that really sucks. I'm 39, so I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm only 11 years away before I miss my window. The cutoff, yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense, but it's still, you have to sit back and think, like, it's kind of cold-blooded, too. I mean, if you're looking at the species continuing to exist, you're going to want young, fertile individuals, not, you know, 80-year-old men running around this thing, trying to mall walk <laughs> through your <laughs> arc. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, with his fucking jogging suit on, <laughs> right? They got the the curved shoes with the curved soles on them. <laughs> Jesus. Um. So yeah, uh, this is supposed to. Yeah. They got to be down there for two years, and so these people now have uh, a bit of a choice as to whether or not they embrace certain death or spend two years in Missouri. So <laughs> in the underground. Yeah. I would say that Missouri is the worst part of that, but, you know. Dude, um, we live in Oklahoma. <laughs> not much better. <laughs> uh, uh, president so, offers a prayer for their survival. Oh, yeah, the presidential prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, uh, at that point, Leo actually, him and his family get a call. They're like, yo, you were pre-selected, you're good to go. Yep. And then Sarah's dad, because they're all watching the news report together, and so Sarah's dad's like, well, I'm going to go to my house. They might be calling me right now. <laughs> yeah, he's all smiling. Like, Extremely optimistic, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to say he does a good job of remaining optimistic throughout the film. He does. He does. Um, they talk about... So we're at this point at four weeks and two days uh, from the well, impact. Go just ahead. before that, we're, we're back on the um, Messiah... And the crew, they do whatever repairs they have to to sustain the ship after the nukes went off. Right. And they decide to head home. Yeah. They talk about there's a radiation shield damage, I guess. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, effectively, they're wondering if the ship will even make it back at this point. If they did decide to go back. Um, or if it'll just burn up in the atmosphere. <clears throat> um, yeah, even uh, uh, Sturgill... Wait, not Sturgill. Spurgeon. Spurgeon. Yeah, he tries to make a joke, and the rest of the crew is not feeling it. No, they're not. <laughs> they do ultimately decide to go ahead and head home. Now we're at four weeks and two days yeah. away from impact, and we see Jenny and Mom together again. Yeah, and she's talking about how she like sold all of her stuff in her house. Um, she donated some shit to the Ark. Mm-hmm. All of her paintings and stuff like that. <clears throat> she says she quit smoking. <laughs> Man, I gotta tell you, if I was over the age of fifty and I was a a smoker, then I would be chain smoking at this point. Like, what do you got to lose? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not stopping at that point. Yeah, anyway. I'm gonna have a drug infused binge at that point. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm gonna have some fun before I go out. I'm uh, not gonna tell you what I would do with the month out, knowing that I didn't get selected, um, because some of my people. Will- who I care about that listen to this someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want them to know what kind of dirt bag I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably for the best, man. I yeah. I know a very limited amount of how much of a dirt bag you are. <laughs> this is for the best. Um so as it turns out, the Hotchners, Sarah's family, did not get a call. Um and her dad's kind of like in a fuck it sort of frame of mind. Uh, he's like, oh, well, well, we find out real quick. Ahead. Jenny was selected. She oh, yeah. She was one of the people yeah. who were pre-selected. Mm-hmm. And you can only assume that it has to do because she like uncovered the story in the first place. Uh, well, and she's like the <clears throat> face of the story at this point. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so... So um, now we're back to the Hotchkiss group. They're not selected. They're prepping. Mm-hmm. Dad said that Sarah doesn't have to go to school because what's it going to matter anyway? Yeah. Um... Um, Leo finds that finds out from mom that Sarah is up on the hill, mm-hmm. and he shows up, drops to a knee, says, "We're getting married." 
you can come with me and because I'm the famous Spiderman, your family gets to come too. Right. He says that if we get married, they will allow you to go. He's like, and I can pull some strings and get uh, your entire family on the thing too. So, And so it's really at this point, even though the president was trying to keep things in order, um, that we really see where the chaos and like the rioting and the looting and all that other stuff has really started to take hold. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the proverbial shit has hit the fan. Right, yeah. Because before this, they were hoping that this Messiah thing was going to take care of it, and it did not. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the chaos kicks up. I wrote it. Uh, we cut to... There was a ahead. really weird montage scene where, like, there's riots happening. Mm -hmm. We see Jenny's mom getting all fancied up. She put on, like, her finest dress and her jewelry and putting on makeup. Right. And we're watching Leo and Sarah get married, which I called the child's wedding. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a weird scene, but... It is. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I was opening a can there, everybody. <laughs> you gotta get that. Sometimes you're just thirsty. You that know? Coke Zero. I'll tell you what, it's good stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, there's. So they, you, they allude to the fact that you think that Jenny's mom might be killing herself, but they don't actually show it or anything. Like you never see her like take a handful of pills or anything like that, but. She gets all gussied up and grabs some pictures and puts on her necklace and like this nice ball gown or whatever. And then she just kind of like lays back in her chair and that's that's the last you see of that. Um, she exits the movie. Um, we get to where we see <clears throat> Tanner is. So Tanner, uh, Robert Duvall, is having a conversation with Monash on the ship. And he offers to read him Moby Dick uh, because he can't read or anything anymore. Well, he's blind. Yeah. Uh, from looking at the sun. And so uh, <clears throat> they have this really interesting conversation, I felt like. Good character building stuff. Where uh, they kind of... He, he talks about how, you know, whenever his wife died... Like, in marriage, he says, you have good years and you have bad years. And he's like, whenever my wife died, he's like, that was a great year, you know. And... Uh, I think that it's the first time that him and Manash actually kind of identify with each other a little bit, you know. Well, um, Manash says that they're the same guy. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a nice moment. Had uh, some good stuff in it. Yeah, read some, some Moby Dick. Yep. Some Moby Dick. Uh, we see where the there's a big makeshift school bus that has come to load up the uh, Biedermans. And find out that even though Sarah can go the rest of the Hotchner family cannot and so she opts to stay and Leo is sad <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's sad yeah. uh, we find out that Jenny gets a call talking about how her mom killed herself and Jenny is sad <laughs> <clears throat> yep dad shows up yeah uh, Yeah. mom signs off all the stuff to... takes all the jewelry up and uh and he's like, hey, I want to talk to you real quick. She's sitting out in the rain. She's like, uh, no. She basically shuts him down. She says, I feel like an orphan. Mm-hmm. And so, uh... Now it's five days to impact. Yeah. Oh, we find There's out, too, site. that, uh... Uh, Jenny's new... Or Jenny's dad's new wife has left him to go be with their mom oh, right. or whatever. Yeah. And she's like, well, how's it feel? You know? <laughs> um... Five days to impact. We're at the ARC site. Um, the buses mm -hmm. are arriving that the Petermans are on. Yep. Uh, it's a pretty heart-wrenching scene because it's... They do the best to show you what the reality of the situation would be. Right. There's literally thousands of people at the gates yeah. trying to get in. It is. There's Yeah, they put up these chain-link fences because people are tripping outside of this thing. Understandably. <laughs> yeah. I, if I wasn't on the list, I would be right there trying to get in. <clears throat> There's but, uh, pairs of animals everywhere, from um, elephants to flamingos. Mm-hmm. Lots of animals. That's uh, that was a pretty interesting touch. I felt like. Well, it's the uh, ark, man. Yeah. They. Um, you know how the story goes, right? Oh, of course. Everybody You're does. Familiar? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I played the video game. <laughs> oh God. I have one of those old Bible games for my uh, NES that has it on there. Oh, where you like get to choose the different books? <laughs> no. Um. And this one, you actually play Noah, and you like run around and collect two pairs of animals. 
but oh. it's called Bible Adventures. Yeah, I got it because it's really. I don't think it's that rare, but it's kind of a novelty thing. Um, I think I remember seeing that covered on a uh, Angry Video Game Nerd. Yeah, he went over it a couple times. I think actually, yeah. Um. So there's that. What was I gonna? Talk? Oh, Theo decides he's not going inside the facility. He's not. He's gonna go back for Sarah, his new wife. Yeah. <laughs> and the family just like deuces. Here's my watch. Well, it's funny because the mom's like, uh, "The hell you are," and the dad's like, "I understand." You know, you gotta get your girl, which is, as a dad, that would not be my my reaction at all. No, you're fucking <laughs> the fourteen. Hell you you stay your ass right here. Right. Yeah. Um. So. Sarah should got on the fucking bus. Mm-hmm. That's it, man. Um. So we see where <clears throat> uh, Leo basically takes off to go get her. Whatever. Um, he hitches a ride. It looks like in the back of some old hay truck or something. Um, yeah, it's him and like a bunch of Hispanics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know who's trying to get up to Virginia at that point, but whatever. Because <laughs> yeah. the President Beck had talked about how whenever the first... Um, well, he hasn't talked about that yet. Oh, he hasn't? Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah, that's right, because it was like 12 hours out whenever he starts discussing it. But yeah. we're really close to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, basically... Jenny's dad shows up mm-hmm. to prove that she's not an orphan. He gives right. her a couple photos. Of yeah, a fun time they had when they were kids. Um, and she's like, I don't remember this at all. And he's like, Well, she's like, Where's my mom anyway? And he's, she's like, Here's a, she's taking the picture. And so, uh, kind of a nice moment, I guess. Uh, and so, and then we find out that all the Titan missiles have been launched, and, and the president's back on air. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did not push away the comets as they were hoping. Uh, nope, this was failed. Mm-hmm. We see... Oh, what is it? Uh, he says that the first piece of the comet is going to hit... The small one? Yeah. It's going to hit near Cape Hatteras. Um, I had to stop, actually, because I couldn't understand what he was saying. And I didn't have subtitles on this thing. And so I went through. I was like, what, what did he say? Because I'd never heard of Cape Hatteras ever. And so you'll be really proud of me, Mike. I went through actually and looked at the the original script on the internet and found that part of the movie and wrote down Cape Hatteras and did a little bit of research and found out that it's in North Carolina. So, mm. yeah, <laughs> didn't have quite the impact I was hoping, but whatever. <laughs> Wait, was that it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. Um, oh well, I didn't look that up, and I knew it was going to land off the eastern seaboard of the United States because right. they fucking told us. Right. <laughs> It did. I wanted to know what, where exactly, though, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's supposed to hit in well, 12 hours. The, Go ahead. Yeah, it, the small piece was going to hit the Atlantic, which would cause a huge tsunami. Mm-hmm. Or he said tidal wave, I think. Right. Um, Same thing. And it would roll into, you know, 600 miles inland. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would topple buildings and level cities. Um, and basically, the whole East Coast is going to be wiped right. out. He mentions, like, New York, Boston... Uh, he, he rattles off at least a good half a dozen names of cities. And I think he said it was somewhere near Ohio that it was supposed to, the tidal wave was actually going to stop. It would make its way to the Ohio River Valley. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, yeah. And he said that basically <clears throat> that's that's kind of like the appetizer because then the second one's going to hit, it is going to get nasty. He said that the sky is going to fill with dust. Um, and then he said that within a couple weeks that all plant life will cease to exist within a month all animals will be dead and the earth will be uninhabitable uh, at that point for two years mm-hmm. which is a good thing because we have enough supplies in that bunker to last us two years <laughs> right. I'm actually kind of surprised about the two year estimate um, because I've I've heard people say that you know and this is for like nuclear statistics or whatever. But I've heard a lot of people in the past say that the that you know if there was like a giant nuclear war and you have to figure in radiation and stuff too, but um, that it would be a lot longer than two years before things would start growing again and thriving. So, well, I think I think you said the key word there, radiation. Right, that would factor in heavily. But, yeah, uh, yeah. We cut back to the Messiah, and. 
Uh, 10 hours and 37 minutes away from impact. <laughs> That's one thing that bothers me about this movie is that these guys are sitting back, right? So we cut to the first time. It's five months. Okay, I got it. It takes five months to get there. Whatever. But then we cut ahead like another two months and we cut ahead like, you know, all this other crap. Like, what have these guys been doing? Just sitting there farting around for like three months or what, you know? <laughs> well, they're going home, man. I guess so, but now they get an idea they're, how to destroy the thing. And I'm like, well, where were you like two weeks ago, you know? <laughs> well, they were hoping the Titan missiles would push it off course, too. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. I mean, if there's something that you can do, but no, by all means, let somebody else pick up your slack. <laughs> well, ideally, they would like to make it home. Right. That is true. And they also mentioned that the outgassing, uh, where the, the gas pockets uh, erupt has left a big hole in the comet. So maybe this is the first opportunity they've had. But they decide that they're going to take the last four remaining nukes that they have and fly it into this big outgassing hole, fly the Messiah in, and light it up from inside. Suicide mission. No yeah. way to return. Mm -mm. And they're like, well, how are we going to get home? And he's we ain't going home, homie. <laughs> and the one, uh, the the woman that's on there, she's like, well, look on the bright side. We'll have a high school named after us. <laughs> I like that. I do, too. It's pretty great. Nice silver lining. Mm-hmm. I, I would, mm. I'd actually, I mean, everybody's got to die at some point. I would take that trade off, I think. Oh, dude. Come on. You get to go down in the history books. Yeah. You saved the world, you know. <laughs> but uh, they, MSNBC at this point uh, finds out that they have a slot that's available in the arc and so they all draw for straws um, no no <laughs> that's not what happens well why don't you explain it to us Mike because I was they have a helicopter yeah and they have seven seats on the helicopter they can take six to the mountains of West Virginia oh, and okay. the other and they'll take Jenny to the arc afterwards I see so they draw for straws is. then. Okay. So they're just drawn for straws to try to get to the mountains of West Virginia? Yeah, so they could be at an altitude that the first one wouldn't affect them as much. Oh. It's like putting a band-aid on a bullet hole. <laughs> yeah, for real. I'm just going there to wait to die. Yeah. Basically. Okay. You get to see the end of the world, I guess. But um, So, yeah. Um, so, at that point... We the, see Theo is looking for Sarah. Right. Um, he steals the dirt bike from Sarah's dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and he drives into a massive traffic jam. As you can expect. I think yeah. that... Well, the president had just told him, told everybody in the United States, if you could get away from the East Coast, do so. Right. And so, uh, yeah. He... I think it's kind of funny. Well, we, we see here in just a minute, but... Uh, we, we cut back right after that to where basically uh, Jenny's friend Beth has like her kid and they're in the MSNBC building and she like took her to daycare so she could play and she's like what in the hell are you doing she's like I wanted to bring her here because she had fun and maybe we're in a building so the tidal wave won't be this tall and we, we'll be okay she's like whatever dude she grabs her daughter and takes her up to the helicopter and of course Beth's freaking out the whole time and uh, she's like, you're taking my place in the Ark with your daughter. And she sends her on her merry way in the helicopter. Um, and yep. so uh, it's kind of funny because right after that, we see where Leo pulls up to like this Ford Aerostar that's maroon colored. And he's like, Sarah, like that. And then uh, <laughs> it's, you find out later that it's actually like a GMC Safari. Two of the minivans that look least alike. He confused, but <laughs> whatever. I think we can forgive him. I would say so, yeah. Um, the fact that he found two maroon minivans in this traffic jam is amazing. Dude, me. this thing's a wall of car like an ocean of cars. I'm, I'm yeah. amazed that he found her at all. But, of course, he's got on that dirt bike, so he's weaving in and out and stuff. So, um, so he does find Sarah and her family. Mm-hmm. And, and like, her parents are much smarter than his parents. Because they immediately are like, you're going with him. Right. They give her like a baby uh, her carrier. Her sibling, yeah. And they're like, you're carrying, you're taking the baby with you. Right. Get out of here. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of sad. There's actually, I thought, some pretty good acting in that scene. Because uh, you could see like um, the mom is played by Denise Crosby, who she's been in some stuff. 
course, she was in Star Trek. <laughs> but uh, she was in um, like Pet Cemetery and stuff like that. Oh, um, that's where I know her yeah. from. Yeah. But uh, she's actually, I think, pretty effective in this. She was in an episode of Dexter too, but um, she, uh, I thought she was pretty good, and she did a good job of showing a grief-stricken mother that basically is guaranteed to never see her child again. But children. Uh, mm-hmm. Both of them, you bet. Uh, uh, Jenny, Jenny goes finds to the her beach. Dad at a beach house. Yeah, she goes to the beach that was in the picture, and her dad's there waiting. Um. And then she talks about whenever she was like 12 or something, she took like $38 out of his wallet. <laughs> yeah. And then he confesses that he dropped her on her head when she was a baby. Yeah. It's pretty great. Um, good little moment. It's kind of nice to see him sit back and have that sort of reconciliation where they confess to doing stupid, insignificant crap <laughs> in the face of demise, you know? Um, right. So they have a little moment to reconcile. And then all of a sudden we see the, the comet. And uh, this is actually a pretty effective scene, I think. Um, I think it's the coolest scene in the movie. I agree. Um, the comet hits, and one thing that I like is the shockwave from the comet. Basically, you can see it's a, a, a space shot, and you can see where it blows back all the clouds and stuff that are around it, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's it's one of the, I think it's actually a pretty touching moment because whenever you can see that basically this comet like all the water in the oceans being pulled back and it's going to make this giant tidal wave or whatever and uh basically jason and uh jenny jenny's dad they're standing on a beach and she's like oh daddy like that and then all of a sudden it hits him and i think that that's actually a pretty effective scene that he was there to comfort her um well, they were there to comfort each other. Right. But she, almost like she reverted back to a, a childlike state at that point. Like, she was legitimately scared. Kind of like my daughter would, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it was... Because I don't think Taya Leone's that great of an actress generally, but I think that she, that was... Her last words were probably the best they could have done, you know, where she just wants her dad. Um, you got New York City in the drink, is what I call it. Where, yeah, it gets fucked up. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Everything. You notice the old Twin Towers sitting there, didn't you, Mike? I did. Yeah. That ages this movie pretty badly. <laughs> it happens a lot in movies, man. It does. Uh, because, like, anytime they show New York City before 9-11, right. like, they make sure that those two towers are, like, displayed in the scene. Yeah. It's iconic. Yeah. Uh... So, uh, we see where Leo and Sarah have given up on trying to go on the road. They find a trail that's leading up to this uh, mountain on this dirt bike, and he decides he's going to go up this thing. <clears throat> um, the astronauts have an opportunity to talk to their families. Um, however, uh, Tanner, his boys, aren't there. They were on active duty. And Manesh, they said that his wife and their baby wasn't there to talk to his baby son. And then, sure enough, uh, Manesh's wife and kid arrive at the very last second. And it's kind of cool. He doesn't ever get to see his son because he's blind. But he does get a chance to talk to him. And uh, they're kind of describing that he's got, like, a little rocket in his hand and stuff like that. Well, he's got Baker, like, uh, telling him what's going on in the picture because he doesn't want his family to know he can't see him. Right, right, right. So Baker's kind of like whispering to him, like he's mm-hmm. holding the rocket in his hand. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty cool little scene. Um, and then after that, the Messiah flies into the comet, and it goes boom. That's it. Blows it into a million pieces. Yeah, a lot of pieces. And they, the president actually said earlier that all the pieces would either bounce off of the atmosphere or uh, burn up. Whenever they're going into the atmosphere, yeah. And so, yeah, he said they all fell harmlessly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he gives us some big speech, and you pan out and see that he's standing in front of like a devastated White House in Washington, D.C. The Capitol building, but yeah. Oh, it was the Capitol building. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also yeah. see that Leo and Sarah made it up this mountain, and like right whenever the tidal wave was going to hit, like they were at the right altitude on this thing, so it didn't wipe them away. Yeah, not only did they outrun the tidal wave, they were also on top of the mountain just in time for the explosion of the big one. Yeah. <laughs> Everything happens in America, Mike. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, the rest of the world, nobody cares about that stuff. It's all about America, so you know, <laughs> why try? <laughs> of course, I don't really feel that way. Uh, anybody from another country that's listening, but I think it's funny that movies in this era had basically that opinion. So, but uh, that pretty much is the end of the movie. No, that is the end of the movie. Yeah, get some credits in there, but that's about it. Yeah. Uh, what was your take, Mike? Is I really? Is I <laughs> wasn't Armageddon good? <laughs> no. Oh man, I can't wait to talk about that. Well, you oh. talked about it five times in this one, so I can tell you're excited. How can we not, though? The two are so similar, and they came out the same year. I mean, yeah, no. It's one of the things. Well, I feel like when we talk about Armageddon, we'll definitely be able to compare it to Deep Impact. That's kind of what I'm Deep wanting to do, yeah. 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 But we might have just saved our time and did, like, a Battle of the Movies episode. <laughs> That'll, that's what Armageddon will be, basically. So, I can tell you right now, this doesn't touch the Armageddon soundtrack. Uh, I'll give you that. Yeah, because I'm a sucker for some Aerosmith. So, yeah, you're right. And they even have some ZZ Top and stuff in there. So, that's fair. Um, one thing that I like about this, I think, over Armageddon, is that uh, they actually show like the the main impetus of armageddon is that um you know they're focused on the crew and we actually get to see a lot of other stuff that's going on with this like people on the ground and stuff like that in this too um but outside of you know like Liv tyler and billy bob thornton like there's not a lot of stuff going on on the ground it's all space stuff in that and i think that this is this i feel like succeeds um in a different sort of way because it does show what's going on on earth in the meantime it well, at least in the U.S. <laughs> right. Yeah, it shows what's going on on the, on the continental United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know. I like this movie. And I think when I watched it as a kid, well, 14, um, that's a kid, right? Sure. Yeah. But when I watched it then, I liked it. But the whole time I found myself like, I just want to see the the thing hit. You know, that's all I cared about. But in this, I actually like it. I got to pick up on a little bit more of the relationship nuances and stuff like that. Especially, um, you know, like Tanner and uh, Jenny and her dad. I thought that they had a kind of a cool thing going on. So, all in all. Well, for me, like, the title's a spoiler alert. Because you know they're not going to be able to successfully stop at least something happening because the movie's called Deep Impact. Right. If they blow it up right away... There's no impact. Yeah, that is true. Well, even in the trailers for the thing, it showed the the comet hitting. <laughs> so, Do they? Yeah. So you know, one of them deals. But uh, I, you know, and it's funny because last week you had talked about how there was all this disaster stuff that was going on, and you thought it had to do with the year 2000. I don't think so. I think that it just had to do with the fact that we could use like computer effects, and so they're like. Dude, we've opened up this whole floodgate for disaster movies now that we can animate it with computers, you know. And so that's what they're going for. But I might be wrong. I don't know. Well, as far as effects go in this movie, they're pretty shitty. Minus the uh, <laughs> minus the uh, the to- the tsunami tidal wave. Yeah. That's pretty good. But, like, the comet itself, like, when they're approaching it, is just, like, gas-looking. Right. Um... It's like the same material they use for Star War, or Star Trek Five. Um, <laughs> the the Great Barrier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when New York City gets hit, like the, one of the scenes shows like the Statue of Liberty's head like bobbing along the bottom of the streets. Yeah. Um, when the tidal wave is like pushing into the land, like in Virginia, when um the two are getting away right uh leo and sarah are getting away like it, it's really shittily just kind of like painted in the background i agree um so as far as like oh we got this great technology for special effects they kind of missed the mark on that one I'll, I'll cut us some slack because it was 1998 but there was one instance in particular where 
I think it was right whenever they were deciding that they were going to fly into it, and it showed the the comet like flying by the the screen, you know. And it looked so bad. It looked like a paper cutout that literally they just like were <laughs> flying it across a, a black starscape. You know, I was like, oh, that are, that looks bad. You know. Are you talking about when the Messiah like enters the comet? It's right before that. Like whenever they decide they're gonna fly in and use the last four nukes. Oh right. Yeah, yeah be- because like the little comet that effect is pretty cool. Yeah. Like its whole scene where it flew in. Mm-hmm. Like everybody is watching this thing like fly through the sky right the uh, wake it creates in the ocean as it comes lower and lower to mm-hmm. the ocean surface like that's pretty cool yeah um that whole the whole scene wrapped around the little one's pretty good yeah but that's the shining star of right. the effects in this movie that's that's where it all went yeah yeah i can see that i don't hate it i think you know but i'm not a big disaster movie junkie either but it was all right i mean it's yeah, i don't it's hate decent. it man i said it's all yeah. right yeah i mean i'm not gonna this is probably the last time i'll ever watch it but you know it's it's fine (laughs) it's all right yeah anyway uh what did we say earlier movie wise i believe we said this was two weeks number one and so we have to pick something to watch next week we don't you do homie (laughs) oh damn way to put me on the spot hey i told you to start writing stuff down (laughs) You tell me um, to do stuff like that all the time, though. I had no idea. Yeah, well, I I, I didn't want to sacrifice the game, so... Um, Who's running this show? I, you're asking me. I don't know. have to ask oh, our boss. <laughs> no, um, I do think... Because what was the... The last one that I picked, I believe, was from Dusk Till Dawn. It was. And so, yeah. Um, I was... I was going to say something and remind you about it, and then I was like, mm, no, I, I can't, man. You know, I just can't do it. Say um, it. What? Say what you were going to remind me of. Oh, to to pick a movie. And then I was like, no, I can't because we got to play the game. The guessing game. But. Oh, well, shit. Now I'm on the spot, and I don't know what I'm going to pick. Well, I guess you guys will have to tune in next week to see what we talk about. <laughs> there you go. I love it. That's good stuff. I don't want to just pick a movie on the whim. Right. I want to make sure I make an educated decision here. There you go. That'll leave them a, a little to be continued for next week. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> next time. I... <laughs> but, uh, all right. Well, um, make sure you listen next time. Find out what movie we're watching. Um, I also... Uh, would suggest that if you have anything we'll post it on our social media when we know what we're going to watch there you go good idea Uh, if you feel as though you have something that you'd like to contribute you can email us our uh, yahoo email address is cheesymovie at yahoo.com you can look us up casino royale with cheese or casino royale w cheese on youtube casino royale w cheese on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts Casino Royale with Cheese, separate words on Facebook. Casino Royale WCH on uh, Twitter. And I've actually updated our Instagram. Um, so it has all of the various thumbnails that I've put into place. And it's uh, Casino Royale W Cheese. All one word on there. That's yeah, those fun. are definitely worth a look. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I'll put up a new one every week. So it's kind of neat. But. Um, I think that's it, man. That's all I got, brother. All right, my friend. Well, make sure you join us next time to watch the mystery movie, and we will see you then. Bye. I'll be back.